Why are bicycles so expensive? What's the best way to condition and train my taint when I am out of the saddle? Are you ever going to jump on the e-bike train and ride slash sell and review e-bikes and components? Well, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeff, the founder and also known as the Dingleberry CEO of Worldwide Cyclery, and I'm here in volume five to answer all of your questions from Instagram and YouTube. There's some serious bike ones that'll actually bring value to you, and there's some very funny ones that'll hopefully bring laughter to you. <laughs> Was Worldwide the first name choice? Well, yeah, it was, because I watched the movie Step Brothers in 2008 in theaters, and it was the greatest movie ever. Prestige worldwide, wide, wide. Prestige worldwide, wide, wide, wide. How does Asagai and Dissector differ in ride feel? So, for those of you that don't know, those are two very popular Maxxis tires. The Maxxis Asagai um, is way more of a downhill tire. It's probably the grippiest tire I've ever ridden. We made a video just about that and just about the dissector. Uh, we make a lot of tire videos, a very popular thing in the mountain bike world. The Asaga is heavier, grippier, and slower rolling. The dissector is much lighter um, and faster rolling. So a lot of people actually have been running Asaga in the front, dissector in the rear. Very common setup on downhill bikes and enduro and trail bikes right now. Um, or if you wanna go a little bit lighter weight, you could do DHR2 in the front, dissector in the rear, or you could do dissector in the front and a recon in the rear. I don't know, a lot of different tires. Hopefully that answered your question. Favorite eyewear for trail riding. I have been wearing glasses on mountain bikes forever. I can't really see anything. I have really bad vision and astigmatism, so my contacts don't really work that well mountain biking, so I always ride prescription glasses. Um, I went through a lot of them. Having prescription glasses kind of limits you a ton and pretty much everything I tried, and even the non-prescription stuff, I use contacts and just non-prescription, I always get like pain on the sides of my head, and I don't know, glasses kind of suck in mountain bike helmets in general. And then last year, I was at this outdoor industry event, and I met these two dudes who had this really small sunglasses company called Ombras. Um, these sunglasses were kind of made for casual wear and outdoor use, um, kind of an outdoor brand, but they have a string that pulls them tight in the back. And when I saw those, I instantly, my eyes lit up and I thought, holy shit. Holy shit! These are the glasses I've been looking for my whole life. Because the number one problem you have is they're either uncomfortable and they push on the sides of your head, um, or they're sliding down your face a ton. Those are like the two most annoying things for glasses when you're riding a mountain bike. The Ombras, once I got them, I took them to my eye doctor, he put prescription lenses in them. I think those guys offer prescription lenses um, from them now as well. But I bought those glasses from those guys. Um, I got prescription lenses in them, transition ones, so they're clear at nighttime, I can ride at night, and they turn into sunglasses when the sun's out. And they are the most weightless, comfortable things on the planet. You can't feel them at all, you can wear them an entire day, there's no pressure, because it's just a band. Um, and you can snug them tight, and they put pressure this direction, so they don't bounce around at all no matter how rocky and rough the trail is. I absolutely love the things. They're not perfect mountain biking glasses because they weren't really designed for mountain biking. Um, so the lenses are pretty large and they sit pretty close to your face. So they tend to steam up a little bit in humid weather. Um, I do know those guys are working on, um, I've stayed in touch with them since and given them that feedback and they're working on sort of additional nose pieces that you can put in there to pull them away a little bit and prevent the fogging up. But anyways, that's it. I absolutely love those glasses. If you have the same problems I do with glasses, check those out. Um, they're amazing. Ombras, O-M-B-R-A-Z. What is the longest dropper post that can be used without a seat? <laughs> There's no answer for that. Who actually has the best warranty in the biz, frames, components, suspension? Um, all the brands we deal with actually have really good warranties, like sort of processes. Most of the brands in the mountain bike industry, the high-end ones are really good and stand behind their product. Some are a little bit more challenging than others to deal with, but who has the best? I will say over the years, SRAM. So SRAM owns RockShock as well, um, Avid, Zip, Truvative. 
Um, SRAM has been amazing like partner to work with in terms of a retailer and a bike shop. Um, if something's wrong with their product from a manufacturer defect standpoint, they just replace it. They're really good people and it's easy to work with them. So I've always been super impressed with that sort of thing. And yeah, SRAM to me, like they do a lot of things that impress me as just a business person and a you know retailer of the brand. And yeah, they crush it with that sort of stuff. So there you go. Why does Jeff always ride in khaki shorts? Well, you don't always ride in khaki shorts, as you can see here. But I do still wear khaki shorts a lot, and that is because my favorite mountain bike gear brand was Kettle Mountain. Um, they're actually owned by a distributor in the industry called QBP. We've been selling them for a few years. This stuff is awesome, and Cool fact. I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. We actually spent the last six months working out an acquisition with them. So we purchased Kettle Mountain, the brand from QBP. Um, we didn't really publicly announce that yet, but we're really happy about that. And we have huge sort of ambitions with that brand. Um, they make really cool, casual, functional, super high-end mountain bike gear. Um, we intend to expand on that, offer new stuff, change stuff, um, and have a lot of fun with it. So we're really excited to have picked that brand up. And uh, that's all I wear now um, because Worldwide technically owns it now. Um, yeah, and I love the gear. And so that's why I'm wearing khaki shorts a lot because they make a minimal lightweight overshort um, that I always wear that's just super light four-way stretch and I really enjoy and has a little hidden zipper pocket on the side for your phone. Anyways, Kettle Mountain, check it out. Um, a lot more to come from them or from us with that brand uh, in the future, ketlmtn.com. Can we get more kazoo content? Yeah, absolutely. I actually have another YouTube channel called Jeff Plays Kazoo 127. Um, it's got like 680,000 subscribers. It's a way bigger YouTube channel than this one. And all I'm doing on there is playing kazoo, and that's every video. You can search it on YouTube. I swear it's there. <laughs> Carbon or aluminum cranks? Um, I pretty much have always run carbon on all of my trail and enduro bikes and even some of my downhill bikes. I have never once broken carbon cranks. That's an extremely rare thing to do, um, but it does happen. Ironically, when I saw this question, I was like, oh, we actually have some broken cranks in the shop right now. Check that shit out. Uh, this is actually from a good friend of mine and customer of ours, this guy named Troyden. He's an insanely fast, epic downhill rider who smashes his cranks into rocks all the time. Um, and he's a really big dude, probably the only person that breaks carbon cranks. I'm sure some people do, but yeah, I'm gonna say 99.99% .99 of people are never gonna do this to a carbon crank and you should not worry about it. I like carbon cranks. They're way stiffer than aluminum, um, have a much better ride feel to them. And this is pretty much not gonna happen unless you're like a pro level downhill racer that's six foot five and 220 pounds of pure muscle. That doesn't make any sense. Doesn't have to make sense when you look like this. Ugh. Why are bicycles so expensive? Um, I've actually heard that question a ton in my life because I've been in the mountain bike world, just cycling industry for a really long time. Um, so I meet a lot of people that aren't in the industry and do have the same kind of question, like why the hell are bicycles $10,000? This seems insane. Um, the most common thing you hear is like, why is that bike you know, $8,000? You can buy a KTM 250 SXF for that same price and it's got way more material and blah, blah, blah. I think there's a huge misconception among why bicycles cost what they do. There's a huge amount of research and development behind them. Um, and that's not, there's a huge amount of R&D behind a lot of different products, right? Obviously motorcycles as well, but bicycles are not made on a very large scale. So the industry is still very much not monopolized or duopolized. Um, there's some huge brands out there. Um, Trek specialized obviously are really big brands that make a ton of bikes. But when you're talking about um, the really high end stuff, nobody really makes a lot of those. So um, all the big brands like Trek and Specialized, of course they make really high end $5,000, $8,000, $10,000 plus bikes. They don't make a ton of those, nobody does. So the fact that the actual volume of manufacturing is so low, plus all the R&D that just runs up the unit cost. There's no one person in this whole puzzle, whether it's the raw materials or the actual manufacturers in Asia, um, or the engineers, the designers, the brands, or the retailers, there's no one piece of that puzzle that's making any like significant, huge amount of margin. Um, it's not incredibly profitable to make really high-end mountain bikes. None of those brands are 
really large that do it. Um, Trek and Specialized are large because they sell a lot of other bikes. They don't just sell high-end mountain bikes or high-end road bikes. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why. Hopefully that explains it. It really comes back down to economics and manufacturing um, and basically how you get manufacturing cheaper once you get huge scale and bicycles don't have that, at least really high-end bikes don't have that and might never have that unless millions more people decide to buy a $10,000 bike next year, they're always gonna be pretty expensive. What's the best way to condition and train my taint when I am out of the saddle? What the hell is wrong with you people? Why are they called clipless when in fact that's exactly what you do with them? So that refers to clipless pedals. That's a very common question. Um, we actually made a video about clipless pedals versus flat pedals. Um, check that out. I explain why that is in the video. Um, it's pretty simple. So in the olden days, we had flat pedals and then we had toe clips, which is that big thing that wraps around that you strap your foot into with the thing. And that was technically called a clip pedal, clip in. Um, and then when they made the ones that had the cleat in the modern day, what we call clipless pedals that click into there, um, you don't have the big strap clip thing. So it was technically clipless, but that's very confusing because you do clip into them and they call them clipless. Yeah, I know. Well, it's just the way things evolved over the years. I know your haircut is your trademark, but I might get that epic haircut. The question is moose or permanent hairstyle? I need your advice, Jeff. Um, I get so many, whenever we ask, like we're doing an Ask Jeff video, there's tons of questions about my hair. People just comment it randomly on probably every YouTube video there is. I know my hair is ridiculous, but it's just kind of genetics. I don't put any like mousse or anything in there. It's just naturally like that. I also don't use shampoo. Cause when I was a teenager, I looked at the back of a shampoo bottle and I was like, why do I use this shit and all these weird ingredients? So I haven't used shampoo in years. Uh, my hair just goes in a swirl. I don't know, man. Sometimes I look at myself and I wonder what the hell's wrong with me, but what are you gonna do? You disgust me. Good training videos on how to tweak and adjust derailers. Um, we actually made a video ourselves about sort of the basic stuff on derailleur adjustment for mountain bikes. Um, that's kind of basic. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube and the good ones are by Park Tool. Park Tool is a great tool company in the mountain bike world and they have an epic YouTube channel and tons of content on derailleurs because obviously it's a complicated part on all bicycles that have gears. Um, check out Park Tool's YouTube channel. To me, that's like the most credible resource to go to when it comes to how-to mechanic videos of any bike stuff. Are you running only in suspension on the Uno just for the free Swedish meatballs? Well, I do have an Olin's rear shock on my current bike, which is a Nuno Dash. I have not gotten any Swedish meatballs, but here's some images of some just to make you pleased, Bino. Yo, Jeff Cayley, when are you doing an Australian tour? Um, I don't know. I recently, last December, did a, a mountain bike trip with this company called New Zealand Mountain Biking, and we rode all over the North Island of New Zealand, all these amazing trails. Those dudes put on incredible tours of all the best riding in New Zealand. Uh, that was a ton of fun. I wanna do those kind of things more often. Um, it's probably a lot easier to do that in North America for me than it is to go all the way to somewhere like New Zealand or Australia, but I've always wanted to go to Australia and ride there. It sounds incredibly fun, so I don't know, one day, hopefully there's a tour company that might be able to help me out with that sort of thing. What's your take on high-end aluminum versus carbon frames? Just picked up a Noli Fugitive LT over a carbon bike for my next build. Um, we get this question a lot. Pinkbike actually did this extensive research study on the environmental impact of carbon versus aluminum, and it ended up kind of being a draw. Uh, they're both not really good for the environment. Uh, just manufacturing them isn't. Um, for me, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of impartial. I had a transition smuggler that was aluminum. That was probably my last aluminum bike that I can remember in terms of like a full suspension mountain bike. I loved that thing. Carbon bikes these days are almost the same weight as aluminum bikes because carbon ones have kind of gotten heavier and aluminum's gotten lighter. Uh, I don't really think anything's wrong with them. Um, they're both great. There's no like huge difference. Carbon has a little bit of a different feel to it and different stiffness aspect to it than aluminum does. Um, but yeah, they're both solid. You can't go wrong. If anyone like tells you carbon is a million times better than aluminum, I don't know, probably blowing smoke. <laughs> are you still not riding carbon wheels? If you are, what changed your mind? 
Um, quite some time ago, we made a video and I kind of said why I don't ride carbon wheels and probably never will. Um, that video, I talked about my experience with carbon wheels and I also said in there that 98% of people would probably love carbon wheels because of how good it makes a bike feel, energetic and fast and just springy um, and light. Um, yeah, carbon wheels are awesome. I think there's 2% of people, the people who are consistently dinging aluminum rims that might end up breaking carbon rims because in terms of just sheer impact, I don't know if carbon's ever gonna be as strong. Um, although that video hasn't aged so well because ever since that video, just even in the last six months, there's been a lot more sort of development in carbon. Um, Revel Bikes has carbon wheels now that are technically not made with epoxy, so they're really strong and really light. Um, Zip made this rim uh, called the 30 Moto that's a single wall rim that seems to be indestructible. We've not seen anyone destroy him. Nate Hills is an incredibly fast rider who just rides his bike every day, has an epic YouTube channel. You probably know him. He's been hammering on those, never broken them. Um, yeah, so carbon rims now, not only do most of them have lifetime warranties, um, but they seem to be like just as strong as aluminum in the sense that like you can just smash them endlessly. Um, they're still expensive though. That's, that's another downside to carbon. So I don't know, good upgrade, yes. Expensive, yes. I don't know, feel free researching that one more. If you were squarely in the middle of two size bikes and had to make a choice purely based on numbers, would you size up or down? What would you base your decision on? Um, bike sizing, that that's a very common problem. Bike sizing can get a confusing and a lot of people, actually a lot of bikes tend to put people who are five foot 10, five foot 11, um, in between a medium and large. And I've seen that a ton in the industry is people are five ten, five eleven, and they don't know if they should get a medium or a large. Um, this is a very confusing topic, especially when you're looking at all these different bike brands and what one bike brand's medium is, could be another brand's large or a small. Um, it's kind of all over the place. So it's really good to know and understand what you like in terms of reach numbers, um, what seat tube length, seat tube height you need to get the proper size dropper post on there. Um, and then personal preference, right? So a smaller bike's gonna have a little bit shorter wheelbase and shorter reach. So that's gonna make it feel a little bit more nimble and playful. A bike, the same bike that's another size up, it's gonna have a little bit longer reach, longer wheelbase, a little bit more stable at speed. Um, I actually one time cut the C-tube on a Yeti 4.5 on an XL to make it the size of a large because I wanted to ride it and I couldn't fit a dropper post on it. Uh, we have that on YouTube. It's a super old video. It's one of our most popular videos still and we published it years ago. Um, I talk a lot about bike sizing in that video. So common question. Me personally, um, I like bikes to be a little bit longer because um, I like that sort of stable race inspired feel as opposed to that smaller, more agile feel. But again, very personal preference. So factor that in. Look at what bike you're riding now, what numbers it has, and then what you might be upgrading to and think about how you want that thing to feel. Can you explain offset? Particularly you recommended staying with 20 mil front suspension that the bike was designed for plus or minus with 20 mil, blah, 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 okay. Fork offset is pretty confusing right now. Um, everyone, no one's really decided on which one it is. New bikes are still coming out that have the more traditional offset. Some are coming out with this more new age offset, like the shorter offset, 44 on a 29, or like a 35 on a 27.5. Um, we made two videos on this. So one we did MTB fork offset explained. Another one we did, um, I think it was titled like, is this new progressive geometry makes sense? And we really tried to take two bikes and compare them back to back on the same trails, the same corners, um, my verdict on it is there's really not a huge difference. Uh, a lot of the brands wanted to make bikes a little bit longer uh, wheelbase wise and reach wise. Um, part of the way they could do that and still maintain a good uphill and agile feel was to reduce that offset. So it's very incremental small stuff that honestly probably a lot of riders would not even notice. Um, it's not a huge change. It's like talking like four, mil, four millimeters, six millimeters in cases. So um, not a super big change. I'd watch those two videos if you wanna learn more on that topic, but I wouldn't get too in your head around that. Um, go with what your bike is designed for. The engineers that design bikes specifically design them around a certain offset fork. Um, so stick with that. In terms of travel of that fork, yeah, if you're gonna reduce it, 
by more than 20 millimeters or increase it by more than 20 millimeters, you're really gonna throw off the head angle on that bike and the bottom bracket height and it's gonna screw up everything. So I definitely don't recommend going more than 20 millimeters, probably not even more than 10 millimeters of what your bike is spec'd for in terms of front fork travel. So there you go, complicated question, but feel free to email us if you're more confused. The most controversial question for the last one. Are you ever going to jump on the e-bike train and ride slash sell and review e-bikes and components? Well, e-bikes, I don't know why they're so controversial. Uh, we one time posted a picture of an e-bike on our Instagram and said, do you guys wanna see more e-bike content? And we got flooded with comments, over a hundred of them, of uh, people saying yes, sure, and a whole bunch of people saying, no, you guys would be sellouts, I would hate you, I like World Wide Cycle because you don't have e-bikes, and like people literally talking shit to each other in the comments about e-bikes. <laughs> it was crazy um, and a bit mind blowing. Uh, we're definitely on the high end side of things in the mountain bike world and kind of cater to that really sort of purist enthusiast audience. Um, so we currently don't sell e-bikes. Um, will we? Yeah, maybe we will in the future. I actually think there's a great place for e-bikes. I've seen a lot of people that are 45, 50 plus years old really enjoy e-bikes because they can get out and ride with the young bucks just as fast or for a lot longer of time. Um, I just last weekend went riding. So we have a couple e-bikes here. High bike, let us borrow a couple. Um, our media guys actually use those and like when they're lugging around cameras and tripods and we're out filming on the trail, they like riding e-bikes to carry all that stuff around. Um, and we use that same e-bike. I had my buddy ride it. He never rides mountain bikes, but he's a motocross guy, so he's not in the best aerobic shape. Did you just call me fat? I got him out on the e-bike. He normally was like, no, I don't want to go ride mountain bikes because he struggles, he gets out of breath. It's a very hard sport, um, especially in SoCal where there's a lot of steep climbs. Um, I got him on the e-bike and he rode right next to me the whole time, laughing and had a great time. Um, and he was really impressed with how well the thing worked because it was kind of this in between a motorcycle and a mountain bike. Um, so yeah, they're fun, they're a different type of bike. I'm not really sure why they're controversial and why so many people get so pissed off about them. Um, yeah, I mean, they're obviously coming and they're getting more popular every year and they're a lot more popular in Europe than they are in America already. But yeah, there you go, who knows? We'll see how things evolve. Um, that's it for the questions. Thank you guys for tuning in, really appreciate it. Drop a comment down below if you have another question you want me to answer in the next one. Please hit that subscribe button and we'll see you later.